uh, ex as, as the MDs okay, because it's not taught the same. So it's mainly the hypothalamus. It's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland produces prolactin. It produces the gonadal stimulating hormones for ovary and testis. And it produces ACTH. And then these endocrine organs produce the next level here, progesterone estrogens and testosterone estrogens, they can be converted. We will see that in this talk. They are converted to estrogens, and the HPA axis oh, produces mainly cortisol, adrenaline, dehydroepiandrosterone, and androstenedione. These two are androgen androgens. Adrenal androgens. So the adrenals are a little similar like the testis, in a way, that produce androgens. And this is important when we age. When we age, then the testis gradually involute, and also the ovaries involute, you know, and then you need the androgens from the adrenal glands, and the androgens can be converted to the estrogens so that we have both androgens and estrogens in the periphery when we get older. Okay, then we have these nerve fiber systems, which is not a typically hormonal system, which is more a neurotransmitter system, and I don't talk about that, not much about that. Good. Then another important thing is to think again of the, of the effects of cortisol. I already mentioned before that cortisol is anti-inflammatory. So green, again, green, anti-inflammatory here at concentrations, as you can see here, in molar concentration, 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 5 molar. And the usual therapeutic concentration for cortisol is somewhere here. If you use very high levels of cortisol, you can go up to 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 even. If you give 1,000 milligram uh, bretnisolone, you can go up uh, in this uh, area here. But the usual serum levels are somewhere here between uh, 100 nanomoles, Where it can be, uh, even then, some people have demonstrated that there could be a, a, even a slight, a slight positive stimulatory effect of glucocorticoids. I don't believe that very much because we usually don't see that. But in the body, it might be different. The body could well be that under these conditions, there could be a more inflammatory effect because you lose, of course, the anti-inflammatory side. You lose these concentrations, and if you would have only these concentrations, you come into this range. This usually happens in a patient with Addison's disease or in an animal where you take out the adrenal glands. If you remove the adrenal gland, you can do that in a rat. And the rat survives. It doesn't like it very much, okay? But it survives. And if you remove the adrenal glands, you can much, much more stimulate inflammatory diseases such as multiple sclerosis, such as arthritis, and such as colitis, where it has been demonstrated. If you remove the adrenal glands, then you go into this direction. Okay. So... Cortisol is anti-inflammatory at ho high concentrations and the opposite at low. And the optimum range is somewhere in the middle. It's the same for noradrenaline. Where we look here now on the local noradrenaline, meaning the adrenaline in the tissue. In the tissue, there's a nerve fiber. And from the nerve fiber, you have this neurotransmitter release. And around this nerve ending, this concentration is meant. We think we talk about this concentration here, we don't talk about the serum concentration, we talk about the local concentration. And in the local situation, if you have high levels of uh, noradrenaline, 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 5, they bind to the beta adrenergic receptor, and here they are mainly anti-inflammatory, uh, uh, anti and at lower concentration, they bind to the alpha 1 and alpha 2 adrenergic receptor mainly, and then they are pro-inflammatory. Here it's very clear, in, uh, even in the culture dish. Good. These are prerequisites that we need for the next minutes. What people have studied, again, in these patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they studied, um, for example, the serum cortisol levels. 
Here in red, the serum cortisol levels in this rheumatoid arthritis patients, and here in green, the serum cortisol levels of the healthy subjects. And as you can see, they are similar. I already mentioned this, that they are relatively similar. Yeah? But when you inject to a healthy subject, you inject interleukin-6, for example, into this healthy, you can do it subcutaneously, or you can do it intravenously, then there is a huge rise of cortisol. Huge. This is the typical response of our system when we have an inflammatory situation. We usually, when we do that in an acute phase, we make a huge rise. Yeah? And this has been studied by Zigos uh, of the Krusos group, and this in rheumatoid arthritis patients, these concentrations have been tested by Dr. Kutelow from Genoa. So, before it's the same level, and after the injection, very high. But interestingly, in these patients, the um, interleukin-6 levels are similar as in those patients that get interleukin-6 injected. At this situation, when, the, when you inject interleukin-6, the levels go up like this, similar to the rheumatoid arthritis patients, yeah, if you inject it. So you would expect in such a situation where a rheumatoid arthritis patient has a high level of interleukin-6, you would expect that it has the same high level of cortisol, wouldn't you? You would expect the same. It's, it's the, the rheumatoid arthritis patient injects his own IL-6 from the immune cells. Yeah? And it should be the same. If a healthy subject gets IL-6 and goes up to a serum concentration of 100 picograms per ml, you would expect that an RA, a rheumatoid arthritis patient, has a similar high level of glucocorticoids. But this doesn't happen. Oh, interesting. This was called inadequately low serum cortisol relative to the inflammatory situation. So the adrenal gland or the uh, HPA axis or whatever somewhere is a problem. In these patients, the high levels of IL-6 do not lead to high glucocorticoids levels. You can also study this nicely, and this has been done by Leslie Crawford, a colleague from the United States, when looking on the circadian rhythms of ACTH and serum cortisol. And you have the two patient groups, the healthy subjects and the rheumatoid arthritis patients, and you see that the, they are very similar, that the serum cortisol levels in these patients, yeah, they are very similar in the healthy and in the, in the rheumatoid. Probably the rheumatoid are a little higher here in the evening, but more or less relatively similar. And the ACTH level also relatively similar. No big differences. But you would expect because the patients have 10 times higher interleukin-6 levels, you would expect that this curve would be way up here, somewhere. Up. But this doesn't happen. Something is wrong. You can do it in another way, and we did this in another way. We divided the serum cortisol, divided by the serum cytokine. Because... Between, and this has been shown, between the serum cytokine and the serum cortisol, there's a linear interrelationship. The higher the serum cytokine, the higher the cortisol in a healthy subject. If you inject it to the healthy subject, you have low levels, you have a little cortisol, you have higher, have higher, have higher, and so on. So you would expect if you build a ratio between the serum cortisol and the IL-6, you would expect that this ratio is constant. Yeah? You would expect that this ratio remains on the level of the control of the healthy subjects like here. And interestingly, those patients with rheumatoid arthritis had only 80, pico 80 nanomoles per liter cortisol in relation to one picogram of IL-6, whereas the healthy subjects had 240, 30 uh, nanomoles of cortisol in relation to one picogram per milliliter of IL-6. And the reactive arthritis patients are somewhere in the middle. Th those are patients who have uh, arthritis after an infection. It's the same when you build the ratio with tumor necrosis factor. It's very similar. Another indication that the cortisol levels are low or relatively low in relation to the inflammatory situation. So you have three, three clear indications that something is wrong. Now, this summarizes more or less the concept and the ideas behind it. 
in chronic inflammatory diseases, too many necrosis factor, mainly too many necrosis factor, blocks the HPA axis on several levels. It blocks it in the brain on the hypothalamic level, it blocks the CRH, it blocks the ACTH release, and it blocks um, the um, production of cortisol. You see here, we're starting from cholesterol down to pregnenolone and progesterone, and these go to the hydroxyforms, and there is cortisol. And on many levels, on the, this level and on this level, the tumor necrosis factor is blocking the production of cortisol. And tumor necrosis factor is particularly blocking this enzyme, which produces the adrenal androgens that I mentioned before. So the adrenal androgens get low, particularly low in these uh, patients. Actually, this was the first finding in uh, uh, patients with chronic inflammatory disease that the adrenal androgens levels were low. Now we know that this, uh, that this enzyme here, the P450C17, can be blocked by tumor necrosis factor so that it, that it can be explained why these hormones are particularly low and cortisol is not very high. And if you do that chronically, if you do a chronic stimulation and a chronic increase of tumor necrosis factor, then you, you block the entire system. When you, when you give a therapy to neutralize tumor necrosis factor, you would expect that, something get be that some things get better. And for example, the, the ratio of serum cortisol divided by serum interleukin-6 increases over time. These are the injections of the anti-tumor necrosis factor therapy here. And with, with these injections, you see there is a rise. Um, and uh, overall, there's a continuous rise. Cortisol gets higher in relation to the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you normalize the HPA axis under this therapy. This can be particularly seen in this situation. This is the serum ACTH, and if you give the anti-TNF therapy, then you see after each injection, the ACTH is increased see, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. It's not an overall increase, but you see that shortly after the injection of the anti-tumor necrosis factor therapy, you have higher levels of ACTH. And it's the same for these androgens. These androgens go up, and you treat with anti-TNF therapy. There is another defect. So, go back, I summarize. There is a defect of the HPA axis by a chronic um, alteration of the and of the hormone production, particularly by the tumor necrosis factor. Then there is another defect that we see in these patients. And this concerns the breakdown of cortisol in the tissue. Cortisol is degraded in the tissue. It is degraded to cortisone. And cortisone is the biologically inactive hormone. Cortisol is the biologically active hormone. The degradation of cortisol to cortisone goes with the 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2. This is this arrow goes down, and a little with the HSD1 in the, this arrow. But the HSD1 is mainly increasing uh, the cortisol levels from cortisone. So it's a kind of reactivation of cortisol. Cortisol is reactivated. And cortisol is degrade, degraded. So it's extremely important that these enzymes, the two enzymes, these are enzymes, uh, whether they are in the tissue, and when, uh, whether the tissue levels are high in these patients. And um, we studied this once uh, in patients with osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see here, they, these are the stainings for the uh, 11 beta hydroxysterohydrogenase, uh, 2 and 1. And you see the red staining here. This, uh, the red cells are positive for these enzymes. Then the CD163 positive macrophages in green staining. And some of these um, stain also yellow here. This is the overlay of the two pictures. This is, for example, this cell and this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell, this cell. So the macrophage have these enzymes. And you also see here this cell, for example, has the enzyme. And this cell has the enzyme. So the macrophage in the inflamed tissue can convert the uh, cortisol to cortisone and the other way around to cortisone. But the question is which enzyme is, or, uh, 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 um, which enzyme is higher expressed in the tissue? And 
we, we started this um, with different levels. So I show you this one, the most important one, or one of the important ones, uh, using immunous the chemistry. In, with immunous the chemistry, the number of positive cells for the HSD1 form are relatively low in inflamed tissue of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, whereas the HSD2 form was relatively high in the tissue. So the HSD2 form is the one that degrades, degrades cortisone, whereas the HSD1 form is the one that reactivates. So you have a higher number of degrading uh, enzyme in the tissue. And if you build a ratio of, uh, of cell density of two to one, then you see that the RA patients, the rheumatoid arthritis patients, have much higher levels of HSD2, the degrading enzymes, relatively to the reactivating enzyme. Another problem. Why do we have this? It has not been positively selected in evolution for rheumatoid arthritis. It has been positively selected for a wound infection. In wound infection is beautiful because then the levels of cortisol are lower in the tissue and you have more inflammation and you can get rid of bacteria because a wound infection is always a problem with bacteria in, 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 uh, and you need a strong immune system and you cannot have high levels of cortisol in the tissue. So it's better to have low levels of cortisol so you have a high degrading enzyme in the tissue. Now, it's a pity this system is used again in the chronic inflammatory diseases. Again. And it's used in rheumatoid arthritis. Such a silly thing. Very silly, but we cannot do something against it. Okay, we can block it. We can block it, and there are indeed some therapies um, already discussed, not on the market at the moment, um, to block the HSD2 form. And in experimental models, it had been shown that uh, the inflammation gets much better because then you have local, high local cortisol levels. Okay, I summarize something else. In the acute inflam inflammation situation, in infectious diseases, you have the activation of the adrenal gland. Activation of the adrenal gland leads to cortisol production. Yeah, prim very good, okay, uh, but only for a short time. Cortisol is released into the blood, and it is also activates the androgen production, but only for a very short time. The up and down, as it it's can be seen, for a short time up and a short time down in the infectious disease is also positively selected during evolution because if you would have had a long, high level of cortisol, you would have died of sepsis. You would not be sitting in this room because you were a successful person, all your ancestors were successful. So, because you were su successful, you kept the up and down, the rapid up and down of the cortisol, but not a long-term increase of the cortisol. Positively selected for acute infectious problems, but not, of course, for the, inflam in, in the, for the chronic inflammation. Up and down is also positively selected. In chronic arthritis, now it changes a little. I already mentioned that then TNF becomes an important factor. TNF blocks here the production of pregnenolone. It also blocks the androgen production, and it also blocks the, TNF, uh, the cortisol production in a way. And then cortisol remains relatively normal. Uh, I mentioned this already before. The levels in rheumatoid arthritis patients and in uh, healthy controls is similar. But it should be higher. This is the inadequate production in relation to the inflammation. So it's similar. The size of my, of my letters here are similar. But you see the size of the androgens is much lower here. The, you lose the androgens. So what should this mean? Why do we lose the androgens? Is a silly thing, huh? No. The androgens are usually anti-inflammatory. And you don't want to have this. You don't want to have an anti-inflammatory system during acute infection. So you remove the androgens, which can be strongly anti-inflammatory. You remove these factors. And I come to this later in, in the afternoon talks. It has also something to do with the energy. 
and with the energy regulation. And I, I let this open for the moment, and I make you a little uh, anx and, um, exciting for the evening or for the afternoon. That you, that I, and you recall that the androgens were low, and that it was actually the first finding in chronic inflammatory diseases. So now look on these blood levels here. Now the blood levels again, cortisol is similar, the AGA is, is, is here, and what happens in a usual situation, you can convert these hormones, you can degrade cortisol, I mentioned this before, but you can also convert the androgens, for example the DAGAS, can be converted in the tissue to the active hormones. The active hormones is testosterone and dehydrotestosterone, and they are painted in green, they are strongly anti-inflammatory strongly anti-inflammatory. It's different for the, estrogen, for the estrogens. They, can all, they, they are also converted in the periphery from the, estro, from the androgens conversion to the estrogens, and then downstream to many more different estrogens. Oh, what the hell? So many factors, so many hormones, so many things to look and to keep in mind. Yes. Now? We found in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we found that um, the 16 alpha hydroxyestrone and the 16 alpha hydroxyestrones in the relation to the two and the four estrogens were higher. I go back. The 16 forms here, see? These 16 forms are higher in relation to the others and in relation to the uh, um, beginning hormones. So it's a, it's a switch. It happens a switch here. It goes to 16 alpha and to estriol, which is also a 16 form. What happens in inflammation? You block the reactivation. I ma mentioned this before. You increase the degradation. So you lose the anti inflammatory cortisol in the tissue. In addition, you block the, you see the low levels of the AGAS. So the, the adrenal gland is not pro providing enough and high levels of the AGAS. But the low levels are then converted in the periphery to the hormones here, and it would be very nice to have a lot of these green hormones. But the green hormones are not there, because TNF blocks the first step from DHS to DHEA, and it leads to the conversion to the seven beta forms, and the seven beta forms are pro-inflammatory. Again, a silly system. Huh? And TNF is also activating the aromatase. This is called the aromatase, which turns the androgens to the estrogens, and it mainly turns it to the estrone. And from the estrone, it goes to 16 hydroxyestrone and to 16 hydroxy 17 beta estradiol, which is called estriol. These are strong pro inflammatory hormones and pro proliferative hormones. This system has positively selected, not for the rheumatoid arthritis patient, where we found it, but it has been positively selected for infectious diseases, for wound healing, for wound repair, for uh, foreign body reactions. So, this is a little complicated slide. I jump over it. <laughs> Sometimes you must do it. Um, when we see, when we look into the tissue now, we see that the green hormones, I could even add cortisol to the list on the left side, um, are low. So the letters are smaller. And on the other side, the letters are big. So these hormones on this side are higher. And those hormones are the pro-inflammatory ones, and those are the anti-inflammatory ones. So, we have another system. We learned that there is, again, a little problem in this rheumatoid arthritis patient. They have no good HPA axis. This is inadequate. They have a stronger degradation of their cortisol, and they have the more pro-inflammatory estrogens, and they don't have the anti-inflammatory androgens in the tissue. Not conserved, not positively selected for the rheumatoid arthritis patient, but positively selected for infectious diseases. So, now we come a little to the nerve fibers. We still have some time. And again, you see red and green, and you see two types of nerve fibers. You see the so-called pain fibers, primary afferent nociceptive fibers, they usually act, be activated by cytokines, chemical, thermal, or mechanical, 
and they release substance P. I mentioned this before when we talked about the oedema formation, the vasodilation, the thing that uh, was mentioned before. So substance P is a strong pro-inflammatory factor. It activates the mast cell, the macrophage, the fibroblasts, the lymphocytes, and the NK cells, natural killer cells, to produce all these good factors here. And this is usually done via the neurokinin 1 receptor, the receptor for substance P, or one of the receptors of substance P. On the other hand, we have the sympathetic nerve fibers, usually in the tissue, in the joint tissue. You see here, the synovial membrane, there's this joint tissue. So the sympathetic nerve fibers release noradrenaline, neuropeptide Y, adenosine, and opioids, endogenous opioids. And they are anti-inflammatory if the concentration of the, uh, of the uh, neurotransmitter is high. Because when the concentration of the neurotransmitter is high, it binds to the beta receptors, and when it's low, it binds only to the alpha receptor. And when it's high, it binds to the beta and alpha. And over the beta receptor, it has this anti-inflammatory influence and blocks, for example, macrophages and natural killer cells to produce these factors here, as you can see. It even blocks the presentation of antigens on the surface of macrophages uh, on dendritic cells. An old finding already from the, uh, from the 1980s. So... What we observe in, you, you would ask, how is, the, how is the system in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis? And the first thing that we did is we investigated the nerve fiber density, the density of the nerve fibers in the tissue, in the synovial tissue. You can do this by using a staining method for sympathetic nerve fiber, which stains for the first key enzyme of the catecholamine production. This is ty tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, Marco Cosentino already mentioned this uh, in, the, in the morning talk. So you can see here an artery. The artery is very well stained, perfectly stained. And you see here branching nerve fibers that leave the artery, that go away from the artery, go away from the artery, go away from the artery. And you can see these spots here these buds, and in these buds are the tyros is the tyrosine hydroxylase, and these buds are also release sites. At the, at where you see a bud, you release a neurotransmitter. Okay, in rheumatoid arthritis patients, these anti-inflammatory sympathetic nerve fibers, oh, these anti-inflammatory sympathetic nerve fibers were very low. Again, a problem. Again, a hormonal problem in these patients. We want to have high levels of norepinephrine, not low levels, because at high levels they are anti-inflammatory, not at low levels. And see, these are the control groups. These are healthy controls. They have a density of two nerve fibers per square millimeter. These are osteoarthritic patients with a degenerative joint disease, you know, osteoarthrose. osteoarthrose. Um, these, they have also the two nerve fibers per square millimeter, but the rheumatoid arthritis patients had nearly no nerve fibers in the tissue. This is different for the sensory nerve fibers. Now look on these two. The osteoarthritic patients have the same age like the rheumatoid arthritis patients, age matched, and these were younger people. It could well be that uh, in younger ages you have higher levels of this pain fiber, so you probably cannot compare this with the rheumatoid, but when you compare the age-matched groups, then you see that in the rheumatoid arthritis patients, they have higher uh, density of sensory nerve fibers, um, and that's, that is called the sensory hyperinnervation in the, of the tissue. Again, a pro-inflammatory si situation, high substance P, low norepinephrine, not positively selected for rheumatoid arthritis positively selected for the wound response. For a wound response, because when you wound the tissue, you see the same. You just see the same change, low sympathetic nerve fibers, high sensory nerve fibers. We looked on this in many, many different diseases. We always find the same. We always find a loss of, of the sympathetic nerve fibers and an increase of the sensory nerve fibers. Again, a problem. So, HPA axis defect, Degradation increased, adrenal androgens lost, androgens in the tissue lost, conversion to pro-inflammatory estrogens, loss of sympathetic nerve fibers, increase of pro-inflammatory sensory nerve fibers, altogether a pro-inflammatory aspect. So 
we looked, we, we asked ourselves whether cortisol, the anti-inflammatory hormone cortisol, can cooperate with norepinephrine. And I mentioned these two systems are made to cooperate. They have the same circadian rhythms. In the morning, they're up and down. And when you use medicaments for, which stimulate the beta receptor and the glucocorticoid receptor, they work better if they work together. And we see the same in the rheumatoid arthritis patient. For example, here looking on the tumor necrosis factor secretion, if you combine the two hormones, the cortisol at 10 to the minus 6 and uh, noradrenaline no, no at 10 to the minus 6, then you see that this inhibition is stronger if, uh, as compared if you use this, uh, the hormone alone. These are the black ones, and this is true for TNF and interleukin 8. And when you look onto the patients and you test, for example, in these patients, Inflammation, so this is, the, is an inflammatory factor here. Then you see that if you have both the TH positive nerve fibers, the sympathetic nerve fibers in the tissue, those patients have sympathetic nerve fibers in the tissue. There are some, they are low, but there are some. And if they have prednisolone in addition, then they had the, whole, the, the, lowest, the lowest level of the inflammatory factor on the Y axis. And um, this, uh, on, the, on the inflammatory factor is here, IL-8. Here is T cell density in the tissue, here is macrophage density in the tissue, and here is the inflammation index. So always when they have, are coming together, they have a cooperative effect. They help each other. But when you lose cortisol because it's degraded, and you lose your sympathetic nerve system because it's not there, then you have a pro-inflammatory situation. Yeah? It's even pro-inflammatory when you have only one of the systems here. It's better to have it in together. Okay. There comes something in addition, the glucocorticoid receptor. I, this is my last part of the hormone aspect. The glucocorticoid receptor is necessary to have a glucocorticoid effect. So usually in a rheumatic disease, you see that the glucocorticoid receptor is a little higher, not too much high, but it's a little higher in these patients without prednisolone. But when you give prednisolone, you downregulate the glucocorticoid receptor. That's a usual thing. If you use the agonist of a receptor, you typically downregulate the receptor. This is called desensitization. Desensitization of the receptor. Okay, the glucocorticoid receptor. Interestingly, the glucocorticoid receptor and the androgen receptor, they, the density of these cells in the tissue, they positively correl correlate. So because this system is the anti-inflammatory system, and this can be seen only in the osteoarthritic patients. But it's not the same in the rheumatoid arthritis patients. You can see it here. This is an anti-inflammatory pathway. This is an anti-inflammatory pathway. They cooperate with respect to the expression of the receptors in the tissue. So when both receptors are there, they can better cooperate as if only one receptor is there. Again, a misorientation, an alteration in the systems. In addition, there are patients who are steroid resistant, and they need higher levels of cortisol, as you can see here, to achieve the same inhibition of proliferation, for example, of peripheral blood mononuclear cells. They need much higher levels, as you can see here. Uh, they need 10 to the minus 6, um, and the steroid sensitive need 10 to the minus 7, approximately 10 to the minus 7, 5 times 10 to the minus 6. So they are called steroid resistant. Something is wrong. Something is wrong in these patients. And this work of uh, Kotzagi, they also showed, they looked on the types of glucocorticoid receptors. We have two types. There's the alpha receptor and the beta receptor. The alpha receptor is the anti-inflammatory receptor. But the beta receptor blocks the alpha receptor. So if you have high amounts of the beta receptor, you block the effects of the alpha receptor. It's a so-called decoy receptor. It, it binds the glucocorticoid, but it does not lead to signal transduction, to translation, to the entrance to the... Now see, now comes a block. Um, I drink a little water. So the glucocorticoid receptor is not going to the nucleus because it's blocked with a beta. And they, this, this, this group, Kotsaki, they showed that in, 
patients that are steroid res resistant, yeah, they, as compared to the steroid sensitive, that they had higher levels of glucocorticoid receptor beta in, in relation to glucocorticoid receptor alpha um, in, the, in the control situation, but also after con A treatment, but also after con A treatment and cortisol treatment, hydrocortisone is cortisol treatment. So the influence of cortisol doesn't play a big role on the expression of this receptor. So we have higher levels of the blocking receptor and uh, in relation to the uh, anti-inflammatory receptor. Another problem. You would not ex understand these problems, all these problems in the tissue, in the system, without the knowledge that this has all been positively selected, not for rheumatoid arthritis. It has been positively selected for acute inflammatory diseases, and there it's good. So I'll summarize, and this is the last slide. There is inadequate secretion of ACTH in relation to inflammation and also of cortisol. There is inadequate reactivation of cortisol from cortisol and increased degradation. There is inadequate cooperation of two systems in the synovial tissue. You lose the sympathetic nerve fibers. You degrade cortisol. There is not good cooperation. Then there is the loss of the androgens, the adrenal androgens, and the increase of the 16 alpha estrogens, which are pro inflammatory. Then there's the uncoupling of the glucocorticoid receptor alpha from the androgen receptor, so they, they are not in the same level. They are not cooperating. They are not, uh, it's, just, it's a similar thing like this here inadequate cooperation. You see it probably on the same level. And there is steroid resistance in some patients with rheumatoid arthritis due to the overexpression of the glucocorticoid receptor beta. And with this summary, I make a break for the lunchtime, or if you have questions, you can ask.